This is Charlotte Talks. I'm Mike Collins. On the local news roundup, voter ID is on hold for an unknown duration as the court says it impacts African Americans disproportionately. The bribery trial of an insurance conglomerate involving the former chair of the state Republican Party gets underway. Charter schools are seeking to diversify by bringing in more disadvantaged students, and light rail riders can expect longer waits for the train this spring. Our roundtable of reporters is ready to detail those and other stories, and seated around this round, cloverleaf-shaped table, are Ann Doss Helms, education reporter for WFAE News. Welcome back. Happy snow day. Yes, Glenn, yes. You all made it in with the deluge of snow. Glenn Birkins, editor, publisher of QCityMetro.com. Thank you for braving the storm. Good morning. Nick Oxner is here. He's the chief investigative reporter for WBTV News, and he's going to get to the bottom of this snow snowmageddon that we went through with you last night. I'm trying to get yeah. to the bottom of what shape this table is. <laughs> Amoeba. Good luck with that. And Joe Bruno is a reporter for WSOC TV Channel 9 Eyewitness News. They're separated by this amoeba table these days. Yes. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. We're all on the radio. If that's not enough, you can watch us on Facebook Live. Voter ID in North Carolina is an on again, off again proposition, it seems. Now it's off again because the second court has temporarily blocked it, ruling that race was a primary motivating factor behind the legislation that set it up. On what did they base that ruling, Glenn? Primarily on uh, on the uh, uh, what types of voter identification would be required, uh, as you as you probably know, uh, when the uh, when the legislature passed the uh, uh, passed a Senate bill, I can't remember the n- number, but they uh, eight twenty four eight twenty four they designated certain types of uh, certain types of uh, identification that would be acceptable. Mm-hmm. Generally speaking, uh, the court found. Uh, they, uh, that would be discriminatory against African Americans. They, they, they said that the types of identification that would be accepted tended to be the types of identification that disproportionately African Americans would have. So this has been an on again, off again proposition. So Mostly give, off give, again. Give, yes, give us a little history of this law because it's, it started, it's been, they've been going at this for years and it wound its way through the legislature and uh, then Governor Cooper vetoed a bill. What happened then? Well, we thought we had it all settled when uh, we voted, when the, when the state voted to pass a constitutional amendment right. that would allow uh, photo, photo ID for, for voters. But the court struck that down because they, uh, that was about illegal gerrymandering, which again they found uh, was done for, to, uh, uh, di- to dilute the power of African American voters. And the uh, thinking of that for, for striking down that uh, constitutional amendment had to do with, do with uh, gerrymandering that they said made this kind of an illegal or an improper legislature, that because of this illegal ger- gerrymandering, they did not have the authority to write a constitutional amendment. So, that, so, the, uh, so it was thrown into disarray again, and it has pretty much been off the table since then. Is there a counter argument to this? What is the counter argument that this is a valuable thing because and a, ne- and a necessary thing because? Well, I guess the uh, probably the best counter argument, if someone wanted to make a counter argument, is that it, it is being done in some other states. Uh-huh. I don't know how it has affected African American turnout or turnout in general, but North Carolina seems to have a more difficult time implementing voter ID than some other states that have done it. Why? Uh, I think because courts keep finding that it's being done for racially motivated reasons. Uh, uh, this this same voter ID law would have also uh, affected college students who yes. tried to vote. It, it, was that intentional? The, 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 have the courts commented on that? I don't think they commented on that per se. No, and what you what you saw was a vast number of college IDs being approved as voter identification, and that had its own drama as as it played out. Uh, I think what the Republicans would point to in the passage of this voter ID bill that's now been struck down. Remember, this is the second time 
this bill has actually been struck down first by the federal courts, now this week by the state courts, uh, is that they worked, uh, and you got the sense as they were crafting this bill in the General Assembly, that they were act, they were trying harder than they had before to be more inclusive in the types of identification and they way, in the ways in which they wrote this. Um, Republicans this week have pointed to the fact that several uh, mem- Democrats, uh, members of the minority party, uh, supported this bill and, 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 and helped them with the effort to in, increase the types and forms of identification that would be acceptable. Um, and I think it's 30 other states is what I've seen Republicans tweet. I don't know the number, but but there is a large number yeah. of states that now requ- uh, require voter identification. So the, the vote that stopped it this time was a unanimous vote by a panel of three state judges. The law was already, I understand, under a, a temporary block after a federal court ruled in a different lawsuit that some provisions violated the U.S. Constitution's guarantee of equal protection under the law. That ruling was set to go through the primary, so we wouldn't have to use voter ID in March for the primary. Could the federal block continue beyond that into the election? In the, in the- but this is too. This is a, a stay. This is a temporary block as well until a full trial can be held. And generally speaking, the um, the the mo of the courts is we're going to put a stop on something to maintain the status quo. In this case, no voter ID, and then we're going to go have a trial. And, and everyone knows that at least in the state level, this is going to go up to the state supreme court. Um, at I wouldn't be surprised if North Carolina ends up back in front of the U.S. Supreme Court as well, ultimately. And so I think it will pro- – if if we ever have voter ID as a result of this constitutional amendment, I think it will be some time before that happens. So opponents of this say this is <clears throat> an attempted voter suppression of a certain uh, key element of the voting population in North Carolina. Not just, not just opponents. Courts have found that as okay. well. And North Carolina is assumed to be a must-win state for Republican Donald Trump. If having to use voter ID, a photo ID, was going to be a detriment uh, and was targeted at African Americans, and it's true that uh, uh, many have found that to be an impediment to voting, and it's also true that a lot of African Americans would not be voting for Donald Trump, could we see an upset because they'll be able to go to the polls unimpeded? Let me look into my crystal ball. (laughs) North Carolina is a very purple state, uh, they, but, but I think it's dark purple. Uh, I, I believe Barack Obama did win his first, uh, his first term, uh, but, but not in the last two elections. Republicans have, uh, re- Republican presidential candidates have carried the last two. Um, I think it's a, I think it's, I wouldn't put it in the must win category for Trump, but I, if he doesn't win North Carolina, I think it signals big trouble elsewhere. So meanwhile, GOP lawmakers have vowed to continue this fight. House Speaker Tim Moore issued a statement saying, we will not be deterred by judicial attempts to suppress the people's voice in the democratic process. And that may sound Orwellian, but it's not because the people voted. I think by 55 percent of the voters last November said yes to this constitutional amendment requiring a photo ID. And they pointed out that uh, each of the three judges that who uh, made the ruling were Democrats. Well, and beyond that, both uh, a complaint has been filed with the North Carolina Judicial Standards Commission by the conservative-leaning uh, Civitas Institute and the Republican Party sent around a press release yesterday pointing out that two of the three judges had previously filled out questionnaires where they outright stated that they were opposed to, to voter ID. And that might sound like something normal for a candidate to do, but what, having run prime. Uh, political campaigns for statewide elected judges, uh, they don't like to take any position on anything. And so now the Republicans and conservatives in the state are pointing to, look, these judges had previously made their position known on a thing. They were biased and should not have ruled in this case. Okay. So a trial got underway, a big trial got underway in uh, Charlotte this week, uh, a trial of a Durham billionaire and two others accused of trying to bribe the North Carolina Insurance Commissioner. Uh, it began on Wednesday. Remind people what this case is about. Yeah, this uh, the billionaire you speak of is a man named Greg Lindbergh, Durham billionaire insurance magnate. Um, and he and and two of his employees and then North Carolina Republican Party Chairman Robin Hayes, former longtime congressman from my area, were all indicted about a year ago, last March. And uh, essentially the uh, 
Federal prosecutors accuse Lindbergh of trying to bribe Mike Causey, uh, the North Carolina Commissioner of Insurance, uh, in order to have Causey fire or remove an employee at his agency who had direct regulatory oversight over Greg Lindbergh's businesses. Mm -hmm. um, Robin Hayes has pleaded guilty uh, before the trial started, uh, and so the trial started this week for Lindbergh and his two employees. That would be John Gray and, and John Palermo. Uh, nobody knows anybody's name in this case except for Robin Hayes, for, for obvious reasons, but it was Mike Causey, the insurance commissioner, that blew the whistle on this. Yes. They did, in fact, come to him. At least that's the allegation. They came to him. And then somehow he got the FBI involved and wore a wire. Is that right? Yeah. So, and and he's been on the stand pretty much since the trial began. There was one short wit. The, the the employee that they wanted fired from the Department of Insurance was the first to take the stand. But largely, it's been Mike Causey uh, on the witness stand. And we've been seeing and hearing those surreptitious recordings that Causey made. This all started. Uh, Causey says when they. Uh, uh, John Gray and Greg Lindbergh asked Mike Causey to make a phone call to the commissioner of insurance in Michigan where they wanted to buy a company. The insurance business is highly, highly – I didn't know, really have an appreciation of this until I started investigating the story. The insurance business is highly regulated by a, a small group of people across the country in different states that all work together. So Greg Lindbergh and friends asked Mike Causey to make a phone call to the insurance commissioner in Michigan. Uh, he does that. Uh, turns out he's testified this week. He didn't really say good things about, about them, but he called the insurance commissioner of Michigan. He testified and said, yeah, we have a lot of questions about these guys too. So he says, yep, I called the insurance commissioner of Michigan and cause he testified. They, they offered to write him a, a, a big check, a campaign contribution for making a phone call. And he thought, this is weird. Uh, and, and after that is, is when he called the FBI. So Robin Hayes pleaded uh, guilty to a lesser charge, yes. uh, and, and that takes him out of the trial. Is he cooperating? Is he testifying? It is not clear whether or not he will testify. Um, his his uh, Part of his plea agreement is that he will cooperate if asked right. to do so. But uh, – so far, Causey was on the stand for so long because they had a lot of recordings. And so I don't think they need any cooperating witnesses because it's all on tape. Yeah, wow. Uh, and uh, course, one, one last note on sure. this, Mike, is that uh, this trial is so significant because Greg Lindbergh gave millions of dollars to both Republicans and to Democrats. He was the chief campaign supporter by his own attorney's admission of former Democrat Insurance Commissioner Wayne Goodwin. But other names we've already heard in this trial include Pat McCrory and Dan Forrest, who, former governor, Dan Forrest running for governor. Uh, Tim Moore is is referenced in some materials that may come up in this, in this trial. So, yeah. And Robin Hayes, of course, used to be a Republican right. congressman uh, from, from a big fall for him. Um, how long is this trial likely to go on? Uh, probably two to three weeks. We'll see. Uh, court is uh, canceled today. They let out early yesterday because of the, <laughs> because of the snow. Uh, and uh, but but it, I think estimated two to three weeks. We'll we'll see how we. It will depend on how vigorous of a defense the defendants want to put on. There are three defendants, and so each of them have their own trial teams, and um, we'll see. Okay. So you reported this week, Ann, and we only have a minute left here, but that a growing number of North Carolina charter schools are setting aside seats for disadvantaged students. Is this a new thing? It had been pioneered by a handful of schools that just said, we really think this is important and we want to do it. Um, and then the state got $37 million in federal grant money to incentivize schools to do that. So suddenly there is a very strong interest in doing this because there's some money attached to yes, it. Yes, that's what was my next question. Is this really about building diversity in charter schools or is it about a way to capture more money for well, charter schools? Well, it is a way to capture money that is intended to be spent on not only recruiting but supporting students, disadvantaged students, when they're in charter schools. Okay, we'll talk more about that and some other education news with Ann Doss Helms, our education reporter here at WFAE, in a moment. Glenn Birkins is here from QCityMetro.com, Nick Oxner from WBTV, Joe Bruno from WSOC TV. We're coming right back. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina working every day to transform the health system for all North Carolinians. More at todaywe.com. Monday, we look at the role of young people and the, that they might play, at least, in the 2020 election. Evidently, voters under 30 uh, make up more than a quarter of the electorate, but for decades... 
those young voters have been largely AWOL on Election Day. 56% of them sat out the 2016 election. 36% voted in the 2018 midterms. And experts tell us it's not for lack of interest. So why? Why don't they vote? We learn what might lure them to the polls on this program Monday at 9. Bernie goes after Mike. Mayor Pete goes after both of them. One candidate who wants to burn this party down and another candidate who wants to buy this party out. Also, prison sentences, presidential pardons, and Bezos pledges billions to fight climate change. I'm Todd Zwillick. The Friday News Roundup. That's next time on 1A. The roundup of this week's news continues with 1A from 10 to noon. After the Charlotte Talks local news roundup, here on 90.7 WFAE. Charlotte's NPR News Source. It's Charlotte Talks on Listener Funded 90.7 WFAE and 90.3 WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. It's the local news roundup gathered around our Spirit Square studio table and Doss Helms from WFAE News. Joe Bruno from WSSC TV News, Nick Oxner, Chief Investigative Reporter, WBTV News. They've been very nice to each other so far. And Glenn Bur- <laughs> Birkins, editor publisher of QC. You know we went we're, to college together, yeah, we're right? Friends. <laughs> We've known each other for ten years. <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. I, I, I went to college with a lot of people I don't speak to. <laughs> so we were talking before the break, Anne, about this uh, move among charter schools to try to diversify and that there's money on the table if they do and that's kind of what's driving this but it's also happening at a, 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 a particularly interesting time for charter schools it is this is the season when charter schools are running their lotteries if they have more applicants than seats and what you see is that some of them have a lot more applicants than seats i think it was just in the past week or so lake norman charter school in huntersville ran its lottery. They had 267 seats available, and that was because they had added a grade level, or had added a classroom at each grade level. So 267 was a lot, and they got more than 6,200 applicants. So Hmm. the schools that people want into, they really want into, and that's why this can be a really fraught topic, because everybody agrees with diversity in general. The idea the state and the federal grants are, they actually say it's about getting more disadvantaged students into high-quality charter schools. So there are some academic requirements, and you have to do more than just have a lottery. You have to provide transportation. You have to provide a lunch program. You have to to compete for these grants. You can't just push a button. You have to apply and say, this is what we're doing. This is why it will matter. So Community School of Davidson is one of the schools that did that, and they are also up in the northern suburbs, very strong majority white, very low poverty levels, And they're saying they have done this set aside, but they have that same type of thing where lots of applicants, very few seats. So they've been adding some students who are economically disadvantaged, but hasn't really made a lot of difference in the numbers. Could this have, if if they're successful in doing this and attracting more diversity, could this backfire on them? Is, this is a terrible question to ask, is one of the reasons people want to put their kids in a charter school because they want to get them out of CMS because of the diversity at CMS. And this way, if you're bringing more diverse people in, could it backfire on the charter school? Well, probably not on the, well, the, now, Charlotte Lab School, which is another one I talked to and one that started this early just because they said this is really part of their core values and they thought their location, which it's not far from here on 9th Street, Uptown Charlotte, um, they thought they were going to have a really economically and racially diverse population, mm-hmm. and, but because the founders were fairly well off and word of mouth, they kind of got started with very low poverty levels. So they have actually changed their demographics, but they said they have gotten some blowback from parents and that they feel like they have, you know, that you are going to be fighting a lot of battles if you're really making a difference because somebody gives up a seat. So if you're listening, go ahead. No, the other thing, too, you have to remember is that charter schools still get to decide, uh, not so with not so with public schools. So they have to take everyone. Right. Uh, so uh, those charter schools, though they may be uh, uh, moving toward a more diverse student body, they still have a lot of say in who who gets to come. Actually, they really don't. They, they don't? No, they cannot just say, we pick you, you, and you. If they have more applicants than seats, they have to hold a random lottery. 
The way it gets skewed a little bit is that they can have preferences for board members and employees' children, and they can have sibling preferences. In a way, a lot of this is a lot like what goes on with the magnet lottery in CMS, and that's what I feel like. You just you see the same dynamics playing out, whether it's schools that are do not reflect the county as a whole, but they reflect the neighborhood that they're in. Glenn asked actually a really good question during the break, and he said, well, if you've got 6,200 people lining up for Lake Norman Charter School, why not just open a bunch more charter schools? And a number of schools have done that, and the state has appro- is approving more, not huge numbers, but what people find out is just because they want to go to Lake Norman Charter School doesn't mean they want to go to your new charter school. And much like CMS, if CMS builds a school in a high-poverty neighborhood, you have lower test scores, you have potentially lower demand, and charter schools, there are a number of charter schools in this area at least that really do serve primarily economically disadvantaged students. And they tend to face exactly those same challenges. And in some cases, they've hit financial and or academic trouble and been forced to close. So if you're not listening to the rebroadcast of this on Saturday morning, you're listening to us at 9.26.54. On Friday morning, it's 33 degrees. It's going up to 44. The sun is shining brightly. The pavement is completely dry. And schools have been canceled for snow. Uh, why, <laughs> why, why did this happen, Anne? Well, you know, <laughs> because forecasters were saying, yep, the app on my phone was telling me it, we'd have a, a, a couple of flurries at 3 o'clock yesterday afternoon. It happened. We'd have some flurries at 5 o'clock. It happened. We have some flurries at 8 and 9 o'clock. It happened. And it wasn't going to stick. They said that. So why, why, why aren't we in school today? Uh, you know, February in North Carolina, this was actually supposed to be a four-day week because they were going to have Monday off as a teacher work day. Mm-hmm. And that ended up being a makeup day for our warm weather tornadoes and thunderstorms from a couple weeks ago. But then, yeah, they got Thursday afternoon and Friday off. I haven't talked to them about this particular decision, but there's always an abundance of caution. There is a sense that this is a huge county, and sometimes it's – very clear in a lot of areas, but I see at some schools, you know, there's some shaded parking lots and sidewalks. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen any snow and ice, but I haven't gotten out and driven around. I think they made the call maybe around 10 o'clock last night was when I saw it posted on social media. They must have felt like there was something that they were worried about. CMS just tweeted out a video that kind of explains why and how they make these decisions, but the first three shots are of kids sledding. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Are they, are they contemporary shots of the reason? I'm guessing <laughs> file art. Yeah, file video. So you're, yeah. You're, you're in TV news. Uh, this Snowbageddon event that we had yesterday, is there any bread, yeah. or, any bread or milk lift, left on the stores? Oh, uh, yeah, it's completely gone. Okay. No, no, it's it's there. You'll be fine. <laughs> the the right. forecast validated exactly as our meteorologist yes, said it would. I'd like yes. to point that out. One one unusual rare wind for the TV world. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't you guarantee the forecast over there? It's certified most accurate. Uh, exactly right. <laughs> Ding! <laughs> okay. I, I got a phone call this week of, at home from State Superintendent Mark Johnson. He's the superintendent of schools. Uh, he wanted to talk about, among other things, his campaign against Common Core. Okay, it was a robocall, but, <laughs> but, but he's using his opposition to Common Core as a cornerstone of his campaign for lieutenant governor. So remind us, Anne, what Common Core is. So many years ago, and I don't remember how many governors of various states got together and said, we ought to have some common understanding of what kids ought to be learning. So the Common Core curriculum standards actually came out of governors of all these states. It went into effect during the Obama years, and somehow it became a big political thing that Obama is forcing these standards down our throats. Mm -hmm. And the federal government should be— Wasn't this a Republican idea? I believe it was a bipartisan idea. yeah, it, but it, then it became kind of like the Affordable Care Act originated or came out of some Republican ideas for health care, and it became an Obama thing. This became a bad Obama thing. I mean, we've talked about this a thousand times, and I still can't get it in my head. Common Core is a way to standardize the curriculum in certain subject areas across the country so that when you get out of school, you've had a common educational experience and understanding of these subjects. Is that it? That is my understanding of the very that? broad strokes. Uh, you know, if you get into the weeds of curriculum, you could have a really lively, interesting discussion discussion about what they're actually what these standards are in North Carolina and they're not exactly common core anymore but I would have to do a lot of research to have that conversation so would the Joe Joe public what there is is just the sense that common core is bad and in fact the state did revise the standard so once 
theory on is, this. Is, is, we don't even it, have Common Core. Well, He's campaigning against something that – but the, he says and other people say, well, it's a lot like Common Core and therefore – it's bad. Is it because we want to write our own version of these subjects, our own use our own facts state by state? You know, I think everybody has seen something it, that their kids are learning or something that they've heard is being taught that, I mean, I'm confused by the way they teach math now. That doesn't mean it's bad. It means I don't fully understand it. So I think there's sort of this sense out there that the government may be doing something bad in the way they teach our kids. And I think that was one of the questions in this survey <laughs> is coming under a lot of fire because it was As not an independent, you know, phrase these objectively. It was Mark Johnson saying, boy, I think Common Core is bad. Do you also think it's bad? And so... And who conducted the poll? Him? Mark Johnson? I believe. I don't know which, if he hired a consultant, but it was oh. basically him. But yeah. the survey has been questioned because he accessed a state database of emergency contact numbers and email addresses to send out 540,000 text messages which he didn't send to me, and 800,000 emails. Would that be illegal or against some regulation? How would that taint the survey results? Well, I think just the question is whether he is using his current elected position as state superintendent in an improper way to promote himself as a candidate. And I think we may get to find out because but a number state of people have filed schools, ethics complaints against him. But so. as state superintendent of schools, would it not be something he would want to know about. Uh, and, so that, of, and that's the rub. Care. And and as someone who's done stories on this general topic, lots, right? Mm -hmm. It's actually the law permits you using private and campaign resources in support of your public office, but not the other way around. You can't use public resources in support of your campaign. Right. So he theoretically could make the argument, I was using my campaign resources to get data as superintendent of public instruction. But we'll see and the people who are skeptical of him say, you've had a few years as state superintendent. You haven't seemed to show a very large interest in this until you became a candidate and kind of started waving that flag. I, yeah. So 78% of the respondents in this questionable survey, although a survey that's been described as questionable by some, uh, say that they want the state to remove Common Core from its standards. And again, what does that mean? And replace it with what, what subject areas does Common Core affect? Math? For sure, math, um, English language arts, social reading, studies. social studies, I believe science. But again, I, am, I would have to do a lot of research okay. to, to really comment on what Common Core does and doesn't do, which makes me think that most of the people answering this phone survey also and don't it, really and know. And it's in place in uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg schools and, and Well, again, it is North state. Carolina curriculum standards that have some influence of Common Core. What have teachers said about this? Well, the teachers who are very vocal are not big fans of Mark Johnson. So what I've been seeing on social media has been a lot of skepticism of this. Okay. Now, whether, again, if you got, sat them down to talk about curriculum, you'd probably have a very wonky discussion that wouldn't be as political. What have they said about Common Core? I just don't feel like that's been a huge hot uh, topic uh, lately. Uh, Mecklenburg County has now opened registration for next year's MEC pre-K classes, which are free. Didn't these start a couple of years ago, and wasn't there some discussion then about why more people didn't take advantage of these free pre-K classes, or am I thinking of something else? No, I think you are thinking of this, and I think it was a little slow getting started. They actually opened registration a little bit late the first year, but the county did approve a <laughs> six-year plan which called for adding more spending, adding more seats, and keep bumping up the income level. Yes, this is free to everyone, and, and now it means that families making six figures are eligible for this free program. Right, it's correct? not free to everyone yet. If, and, of course, you can't commit to future boards. So they can say, we want to do this, but each budget year they have to go right. through that. It'll be part of this coming year's budget. But, yeah, they're, they're essentially saying this. It's not exactly like public kindergarten in that it's not mandatory, but they're assuming that if the demand is there, that 80% of four-year-olds will eventually be in this. And this is – go ahead, Joe. Well, I was just going to say that they want to add 36 pre-K classrooms next year. That would allow 648 new children to be served, and that would bring the total number of classrooms to 105 and children served to 18. When you say classrooms and when you say uh, Mecklenburg County pre-K classes, I immediately think – Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools. That is not the case here. It's is very it? confusing. There is Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools has Bright Beginnings programs, right. which are mostly or 
totally in their schools, and it is run by Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools. And that is not income-based. It's they assess your skills, and if they think your child needs help to be ready, then you're admitted. There's North Carolina Pre-K, which is administered by Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, but is housed in actual pre-K child care centers out in the community. And then MEC added on to that saying there's more need and it's just so important. And they're saying we invest all this money in K-12 and if the kids come in behind, the, the, the chances of catching them up are so not So why that great. is it bifurcated? Why isn't this all part? Why don't they just give all the money that they f- use for pre-K, free pre-K, and give it to CMS and let them do it in, in a school setting? where allegedly they are equipped to handle this. Well, A, they don't have the school settings. There's not a bunch of classrooms sitting around unused. B, Mecklenburg County is saying this is actually an economic development thing, too, in that it helps community child care centers that are out there in all these different neighborhoods. It lets them spread it out to where parents are already taking their kids. If you have a one-year-old and a four-year-old, they could be in the same child care center, just the four-year-old is getting the subsidized care. And it's a little bit weird in that if you actually need what most working parents need, which is carry during the summer and the holidays and after hours, you may have to pay something for that. But it is, and these child care centers have traditionally not paid a lot to their staff. Right. But the teachers now, if you get this MEC pre-K money, you have to have certified teachers and you have to pay them on the CMS scale. So it's increasing wages to some of these folks who are doing the work. So before we move on to other topics, a couple of weeks ago we were told that CMS had made changes to the projects that voters had said yes to in a bond referendum a couple of years back, reducing the size of those schools. I think high schools were reduced by 25 classrooms that have yet to be built, by the way. Uh, We also found out that they need more money to do what they want to do with those schools, so more money for less because cost overruns have necessitated their going uh, to the county for more funding. And their, their, the school's consultant says some of those overruns were built into the budget, but probably not enough. Huh? Yeah. Well, they've hired <laughs> Dennis Lacaria, who we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. And I should say, I heard y'all talking about it last week. The school board would say we have not decided firmly to reduce the size. Okay. We are considering it. And it popped up in our reports and sat there for months. And uh, now we're... so. On Tuesday, they're saying they're going to have this meeting and they're going to really clear the air. But uh, Dennis Lacaria says that the county budgeted for basically 11% inflation as part of the $922 million bond package. And he says it's running 20% already. So he's saying they did what they should do, which is, you know, costs are going to go up, but they couldn't anticipate how much. And he's saying that's partly the tariffs and that's partly, which is supplies and Partly all this construction you see around Charlotte, and that affects labor costs. And they're also starting a build-up already to the 2023 bond referendum. Why? Do they think that what they've just talked about with the bond referendum from, from, from several years ago will make it more difficult to pass a 2023? No, this is just – it's typically a long okay. process, and they're saying they're going to look at the standards, and they're going to get lots of community engagement. 2023 is – Lucaria is saying that, but Elise Dashie is saying, ah, we're not locked into that. And CMS also says they're in the beginnings of a, quote, man mandatory Title IX survey of all students in grades 5 through 12, asking them to list their sexual orientation. What entity made this mandatory, and why do fifth graders even have an opinion on that topic? I was actually sort of hoping that had not gotten thrown into the mix. I'm still trying to get questions answered about that. I feel fairly certain based on a number of teachers who have told me they're administering this, that this is happening, Mm -hmm. and I have not gotten anybody from CMS to explain. I had to tell their public information office, look, this is who's doing it. So um, it is part of, a, I believe, a Title IX survey that's about school climate. Title IX, of course, is about sex discrimination. Apparently, they want to know how things are for transgender and LGBTQ kids. Okay. Light rail delays are ahead. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about... Uh, uh, CMPD and a couple of other issues as well when we come back at Charlotte Talks. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Northeastern University presenting Women Who Empower Mind and Body featuring Angela Yoakum of Novant Health and Dr. Holly Jimison of Northeastern. Wednesday, February 26th, northeastern.edu slash 
Charlotte. A federal judge has sentenced Roger Stone, a longtime friend of the president, to more than three years in prison. The Boy Scouts of America filed for bankruptcy on Tuesday in the face of 275 lawsuits by former members alleging sexual abuse by scout leaders. And a look at the most recent Democratic presidential candidate debate, all coming up next as the roundup continues on 1A in 20 minutes at 10. You're invited to join Charlotte Talks next Friday as we take this local news roundup across the border to Amelie's in Rock Hill just one day before the eyes of the nation will be upon South Carolina for their primary vote. We'll talk about that and also cover the top Charlotte stories of the week. You can get information at WFAE.org slash Charlotte Talks. Hope to see you there. It's your world. We help you explore it. Coronavirus has many countries sealing their borders with China, and that includes China's already reclusive neighbor, North Korea. It's your community. We help you understand it. The Charlotte area is the largest metro area in the country without a medical school. North Carolina's five current medical schools are in WFAE's Morning Edition is an essential way to start your day and stay connected to your world. Listen weekday mornings from 5 to 9 on 90.7 WFAE. Eight Charlotte Talks and the local news roundup on 90.7 WFAE and 90.3 WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. It's, it, we're, we were here with uh, Nick Oxner from WBTV News, Joe Bruno from WSOC-TV, Glenn Birkins, editor-publisher of QCityMetro.com, and Andos Helms from WFAE's newsroom. Charlotte's light rail blue line is experiencing slowdowns. Who knew? Mechanical issues have called, caused the trains to sometimes be behind schedule as much as 15 minutes, and Mayor Pro Tem Julie Eiselt says that undercuts light rail's selling point. Why people like light rail versus buses, no matter how modern you make a bus, is, is they are efficient and they're dependable. You know when they're going to come. So if you don't know when they're going to come, you're sort of back to where you are with buses. But like Elizabeth Warren, Katz has a plan. What is it? <laughs> so if you've noticed, if you're a regular light rail rider, you might notice that Katz keeps sending out alerts that the train is delayed for 15 minutes, 8 minutes, 30 minutes due to mechanical issues. So we finally got around to asking, like, what is going on with these trains? It turns out about 20 of them are the originals from 2005, and they're due for extensive maintenance. Um, so they're going to have to send those 20 starting in 2021 to Sacramento, California for a midlife overhaul. This is going to cost about 30 to $50 million. Lord. So they're going through a midlife crisis. Exactly, okay. exactly. <laughs> um, they thought that when the entire track opened from end to end, 485 to UNC Charlotte, you'd be able to do the whole route in 57 minutes. Well, it mm -hmm. turns out it's taking 63 minutes. So they've been putting their spare light rail vehicles on the track to try to ensure that all riders would be picked up in seven and a half minutes during the weekday peak times. Because of how fast the trains can go and the, the spare trains keep breaking down, they're extending the amount of time you have to wait for a train to nine minutes during those weekdays. So they're increasing hours. the wait time Correct. by 90 yeah. seconds. 90 seconds. So you're going to have notice. to wait longer. Um, well, they're waiting a long time already for the trains. But um, I, I think that this is a way for them to get ahead of it. So when come 2021, when more trains get brought out of circulation to be sent to Sacramento, then people are used to waiting a little longer. Are we buying any new trains, new vehicles? I mean, I think the lifespan of these vehicles is what, 30 years? About 30 years, yes. Halfway, we're at the halfway point. Correct, for at least half of them. And okay. Katz says they do want to purchase more vehicles, but obviously that's a cost that comes there. It's about $6 million per vehicle, and uh, those funds haven't been identified. And why do they have to, I know they're built in Sacramento, why do they have to go back to Sacramento? Why can't Sacramento come to us? They're the manufacturer, that's a good question. The <laughs> <laughs> manufacturer is the only one who could do this extensive work, so they literally have to break down the trains, put them on a big rig, and haul them out there. Wow. Okay, so th that means there'll be fewer trains than there even are today, because I think they're taking, what, 20? 20. They won't out be, of service? Yeah, they won't be taken all out of service at once. They'll be spread out over four years. Okay. Uh, Mecklenburg uh, County is uh, questioning the managed care services provided by a company called Cardinal Innovation, which we have talked about a lot uh, several years ago, Assistant County Manager Anthony Trotman des has described them as not adequate, these medical care services. And after he made a presentation to County Commission, Commissioner Trevor Fuller said, this is really bad. We are in a mess, and I fear that people's lives are being put at risk because of this. And Commissioner Susan Harden said, I'm stunned. I can say I am extremely concerned. What are they talking about? 
Well, uh, the county manager, the assistant county manager kind of rattled off a bunch of issues that the county is currently experiencing with Cardinal Innovations. They're uh, the managed care organization for Mecklenburg County, and they help coordinate behavioral and mental health services for Mecklenburg County. Uh, some of the issues that they said that Cardinal, their experience with Cardinal include uh, 43 children that were in emergency residential placement were denied or delayed access to Cardinal's network of care. Um, a spokesperson for Mecklenburg County told me that taxpayers had to pick up the tab when these children couldn't be placed in care. Um, ultimately, 127 children experienced county-funded emergency placements in 2019. And then they also talked about the impact that community partners are experiencing because of Cardinal. They referenced the mobile crisis team. Uh, they missed 52 calls from now to December 2019. Mobile crisis is saying that their funding was cut by Cardinal, and that resulted in mobile clinicians having to be cut from eight to three, and that's contributing to these calls. I, I'm actually surprised that we're even talking about Cardinal uh, innovation because we we went through a whole conversation about uh, what it was had to do with overpayment and and them them operating like an, a, not a government. Uh, they're not a government. There have been for, concerns about their care. Right. I mean, I did a brief stint on a health care beat in 2014, and I was hearing this kind of thing. Um, and then after that, there was a lot about there was some change in management and they had a CEO who was being really highly compensated and there was a lot of controversy yeah. over that and then they kind of cleaned house there so I guess this is the new administration so the new administration has said that this is a very valuable Mecklenburg County is a very valuable client to them uh, are they being are they at risk of losing their position uh, that is an option the county can choose to break up with Cardinal I think Cardinal kind of felt blindsided by this. They didn't have an advance warning. It was actually a Charlotte Observer a reporter who called Cardinal for a comment before the presentation. Cardinal had no idea what she was talking about. Wow. They, this, this wasn't on their agenda. They weren't invited to be at the presentation. So they will get in front of county commissioners and kind of explain their side of things. But, and, and Joe, you all, I'm sick of it. But this isn't new, and it's not even new within the last year or so. There have been plans to totally reimagine how we handle managed care across the entire state. Those plans have been put on hold. Um, but, but the concept and the idea that our current managed care model in North Carolina isn't serving the needs of mm -hmm. the people who need it, which are, remember, highly, highly uh, – unstable populations and populations that need all the help they can get uh they're just not meeting the needs and i think they're the governor's administration the general assembly the end user all agree that it's not working and mecklenburg can't just clap their hands and get rid of cardinal it's a really long process it, they have to provide a nine-month notice and they have to receive dhhs approval and only two counties in north carolina have ever split away from their mcos nash and rutherford so not all you reported on something else this week because not all neighborhood improvements evidently go smoothly. Uh, for instance, someone wants to open a martini, tapas, and wine bar in the vacant building in Enderly Park. Correct, off Tuckasegee Road. Yeah, don't they cater to elderly people in Enderly Park, or isn't it, isn't that a fairly stable neighborhood that? Uh, one would not associate with the martini bar. It's changing. Uh, Enderly <laughs> Park is changing, uh, not not quite as rapidly as some areas of the on the west side, uh, but uh, gentrification has definitely come to Enderly Park, and uh, and I think in the years to come we're going to see a lot more of so it. So this is not necessarily about people being opposed to something new coming into the neighborhood, but there is a problem evidently with parking. Right. Uh, the the venue is going to have capacity of about eighty three people. And there are only going to be eight parking spots. Wow. So neighbors are like, what's going on here? Our car is going to be parking all over our neighborhood. The prospective owner of this facility says that he has verbal agreements from an air conditioning business next door, a convenience store across the street in the church next door overflow to parking. allow overflow parking. But the city's like, you need to get that in writing before we sign off on it. And this. City Council's Braxton Winston says, given the nature of the business, it's a martini bar, that less parking may be better. <laughs> he has a point there. But I think that, you know, the neighbors also have a good point that they don't want their neighborhood overrun with vehicles. Okay. Your colleague, uh, your colleague Nick <laughs> David Hodges, reported this week that after an historic year of homicides in Charlotte, five cases from 2019 had charges dropped or dismissed because of procedural problems. What happened? Yeah, so uh, David Hodges found that uh, there were three uh, cases where charges were just outright dismissed, all because